So beginning with the first passages, extract A and extract B, question one. Both extracts mention that during the trip, the passengers, and then it has a list of different experiences. So there are two clues in this question. The first one is it specifically says both extracts. And the other aspect, it says that uh, during the trip, the passengers. So we're referring to both of the extracts, the common experiences, but also the specific aspects of them where they were actually traveling. In the first extract, the part where they were traveling was over here. And the clue is the heat inside the vehicle was oppressive, right? The heat was oppressive um, implies discomfort. Likewise, in the second extract, the part where they are traveling is over here when they are moving up towards the Gold Coast. And it says face faces smashed against glass, no leg room, two smallest children illegally wedged between various legs. So this seems like it's also a very uh, uncomfortable situation where they're all um, pretty much cramped up inside the vehicle. And that's why the best answer was uh, experience some discomfort C. Question two, which group of travelers pass the time by talking? Now, the answer to this one, I believe, was the college group. So if we scroll back up, the aspect um, where the answer to this question is, is over here. I know a lot of students will be thrown off by the fact that it says silence was golden, but um, of course you can't be misled by red herring such as that. The giveaway for this one is towards the end of this paragraph where it says, the passengers chirping and chattering like budgerigars. That implies that they were talking a lot, which is why the answer to this one was the college group. Question number three, in which extracts do the people dislike spending time in natural surroundings? And the answer to this one was extract B. So it states very clearly at the very beginning, my family isn't the outdoors type, implying that they're not exactly nature lovers here. That's why the best answer to that question was extract B. Question number four, in extract A, why is the clump of wayside willows significant for these students? So scrolling back up to extract A, specifically the part that has been um, very kindly highlighted for us, the clump of wayside willows over here. And what is the significance of this? Well, it says here at which the governess in charge, the person in charge would invariably call a halt. A halt is a stop, it's where they pause, and then they head for home. So that implies that they would pretty much go on their regular walks. And then as soon as they hit the clump of wayside willows, that's when the governess would call a halt. They would tell everyone to stop. And afterwards they would head home. Now with that in mind, when you look through the answer choices, the answer was it is the furthest point on their regular walks. And that's because at the stage where they reach this clump of wayside willows, they stop, they halt, and then afterwards they go home. So that is the furthest point in their walk. Question five, in extract A, who appears to be in charge of the excursion? Okay, this one was a little bit confusing just from the sheer number of names that were thrown around in extract A. So we have a lot of names strewn throughout this paragraph here. In addition, you have, um, you know, going, going further down, you have names such as Mr. Hussey, you have names such as Miss McCraw. So it's a bit confusing just because of the sheer number of names that are used uh, throughout the passage. As I said, in a future video, we will go through the different concepts of how you can um, you know, more quickly derive at the answer in terms of how you approach the text in the first place and the kinds of notes that you should make in the margins. But uh, you know, for the purpose of this video, just discussing the answer choices themselves, the best answer was Miss McCraw. And the reason for that is because this um, character, the Mademoiselle, she basically asked her a question about, um, you know, why they couldn't take their hats off. And Miss McCraw says, certainly not, because we are on an excursion, there's no necessity to look like a wagon load of street urchins. Um, that obviously carries a very uh, authoritative tonality towards it. So Miss McCraw is clearly in charge, telling them that they are not allowed to take off their hats. That's why the best answer for this one is Miss McCraw. The answer was C. Question six, in extract A, what does the writer suggest by hats were removed without further comment? So again, it's been highlighted for us already. If we scroll back up, it says hats were removed without further comment and biscuits handed around. Now, bear in mind, a lot of, um, you know, we always say that with small detail questions such as this, where they refer to a specific aspect of the text, you want to read contextually. So when you read the further context of it, it's essentially that uh, this group of passengers has arrived at their destination and afterwards they begin to relax. Right. They, um, you know, they bask under the shade of an old white gum. They um, keep the, you know, the milk and lemonade as now getting unpacked and consumed. And of course, they start removing the hats and handing around biscuits, where you notice that this contrast to previously Miss McCall forbade them from taking off their hats implies that now they're in a much more relaxed situation. That's why the best answer is D. College standards were now being relaxed because they had arrived. Question seven. How does a writer in extract B feel when the roller coaster comes into view? The answer for this one is awestruck, and the evidence is here when it actually discusses 
the family arriving and uh, this particular character um, seeing the roller coaster again, right? The Dream World's roller coaster. It says he felt an overwhelming sense of wonder. He, they would crane their necks back trying to take in the sheer majesty of it. it implies that, of course, they were very um, awestruck. They were impressed by what they were seeing and they were amazed by it. None of the other words in, um, in the answer choices really do justice to that, to that emotion. They certainly weren't scared and they weren't, you know, just relieved, nor were they confused about it. So the best answer, answer is awestruck. Question eight. From the first two paragraphs of extract B, we get the impression that. Okay, this one is a question where you really have to read all the answer choices very carefully. And of course, like I mentioned, we'll release another video where we discuss the approach towards the text that will help you discern the, you know, the tone and the big picture meaning behind each paragraph. Um, but specifically for the case here, it says in the first two paragraphs, what do we know about the family and their attitudes, essentially? That's what we're trying to infer. So um, it tells you that the family isn't the outdoors type. Even though they were raised on the coast, the parents both, the mum and the dad, disapproved of going to the beach for different reasons. One of them was that um, it brought sand into the house. The other parent, it was the case of uh, not wearing thongs because it splits the toes. They also never camped. And all those things that involved camping never appealed to us. So first thing you notice is that the family is pretty uh, united in their beliefs. They all believe the same thing. Um, and then the second thing you notice, of course, is that uh, they didn't like the things that you might expect them to like, that other families in these situations would be expected to like. So for example, if someone was growing up on the coast, it's just natural that they would learn to um, have an enthusiasm for, for that particular area. And that's why the best answer to this question is actually B. The writer is aware that others might find his family's love of theme parks puzzling because two, two reasons for this answer. Number one is that they don't enjoy the things that you might expect them to enjoy. And number two, when you scroll back up, this aspect specifically talks about their love for theme parks. We preferred theme parks. Um, and the reason for it is, of course, that uh, they were clean, they were safe, and more importantly, it transcended racial language and age barriers. So this implies that, um, you know, they have a, a particularly unique love for theme parks, which is unexpected of other families and um, people to share, which is why the best answer is B. Going through the other options as well, you notice that none of them actually work in this context. So A, not every family member shared the parents' enthusiasm. That's not true at all. Like we said, everyone is united in their belief that they all like the theme parks, everyone in the family likes theme parks. Option C, the writer regrets not experiencing camping trips. They don't talk about any sense of regret and theme parks are no longer as attractive. Again, they don't talk about any comparison in terms of whether they used to like it compared to whether they still like it now, which is why the best answer is B. Going down to the next text. So we have a poem here, um, an interesting poem on the whole. So question number nine, the title of this poem. So what is the title? Scrolling back up, we see that it is the fish. This is the title because it's, it's bigger, it's in bold, and it's in italics as well. Um, but the rest of the poem doesn't really quite make sense when you separate the title from the text, right? Wade through black jade just by itself doesn't make any sense. In fact, the sentence should be the fish wade through black jade, right? So the fish is the subject of this sentence, which implies that the title itself leads on to the rest of the poem. The best answer is um, D, leads us into the poem itself. It's actually part of the poem. Question 10, what is compared to an injured fan? Okay, go, going back and reading the context over here. So it's been highlighted. Um, make sure that when you read something like this, you read the entire sentence to get the context. So of the crow blue mussel shells, one keeps adjusting the ash heaps, opening and shutting itself like an injured fan. So the subject of the sentence here is the muscle shells. And those are the things that are opening and closing, just like a fan. So the best answer for this one is muscle shells or muscles, which was C. Question 11, what lights up the water? So um, again, when you read the poem, ideally, so when you read the poem, ideally you would have already made note of the different, um, you know, what exactly each stanza is referring to or the different parts of the poem are referring to. Now, in this case, you know, we're talking about something um, illuminating or lighting up the water. And that is specifically to do with this part of the poem. It says, the barnacles, which encrust the side of the wave, cannot hide there for the submerged shafts of the sun split like spun glass, move themselves with spotlight swiftness into the crevices. So essentially this was the water surface. Um, you have the sunlight essentially um, coming down and submerging itself and then spreading throughout to, you know, to highlight every crevice of this place, which implies that the sun's light is really illuminating the entire water. So the best answer here is B, the sunlight. 
Question 12. In the way the writer uses the following words, which one is the odd one out? So note specifically it says in the way the writer uses the following words. Um, the way the writer uses the following words implies that um, it's, it's about it's about how it's actually expressed, the context in which the words are used. Uh, all these words occur in stanza over here. It talks about um, bespattered jellyfish. It talks about the crabs. It talks about, it doesn't actually refer to the green lilies, does it? This is not the subject here. It's not describing the lilies as a separate object. Um, of course, it mentions toadstools as well. Instead, what the, the lilies are used as a point of comparison. It's used as a simile rather than as the main focus of what the poet is trying to describe. And that's why it's the odd one out because it's used purely for comparison rather than actually discussing the object itself. The answer was A. Question 13, the cliff has marks of abuse caused by what? So scrolling up to the part where it says marks of abuse in this stanza over here, it says marks of abuse are present on this defined uh, edifice. All the physical features of accident. So we have physical features of accident. Um, lack of corners, I believe that's like a, a material that's used as an edging or as a, um, as a boundary or border essentially. Dynamite grooves. Now dynamite is an explosive that humans use for different purposes. Burns and hatchet strokes. So a hatchet, again, it's a tool similar to an axe. So the fact that, you know, the, the edifice has been affected by things such as dynamite and things such as hatchets implies human intervention it implies that people are doing something over here it's marks of abuse caused by people best answer was d question 14 what does the form of the poem as a whole reflect okay what does the form reflect so form refers to the physical features of the poem itself um, that can be from a number of different things it, of course it could be from the layout and how the poem physically looks it can also just be from things like um, you know the number of lines the length of the lines the structure of the stanzas what is a rhyming scheme and, and things like that so it's the physical features of the poem itself and in this case you notice that it has been written in a very deliberate deliberate way um, almost to resemble the the waveform almost to resemble waves of of um, a body of water so you can see that you know the fish wade right through black jade and then this part comes in and it's much longer line re regresses a bit then comes back out um, and on the whole so i know i'm focusing very um, closely here but when you look at it on the whole you can see that it, it looks like the ebb and flow of a wave so that's why the best answer for this one I'm sorry bear with me scrolling back down the best answer for this question is C, the movements of the waves. Next text, octopus. Okay, so this I believe was the closed passage and it's a bit unconventional. Um, to be honest, as I mentioned earlier, we will discuss the principles towards your approach to the comprehensive piece. And the approach for a text such as this is not too different to things that we have already been teaching before, but we completely understand that a lot of students are thrown off by the fact that um, it's a different text type to perhaps what they may be used to. Uh, nonetheless, we will go through the questions and hopefully that will give you a bit more clarity. But the aim of the game here is really about context. So what happens for a lot of these questions you notice is they'll give you a sentence, let's call it sentence A, right? And they'll have sentence B and that's missing. And then they have sentence C. And your job is basically to try and find the link, which element, um, which of the answer choices links option A to C via B. So that B would be an answer essentially, right? So it's all about context. You need to figure out what is the context of the sentence that we, that is in question, the sentence B, or in this case, sentence 15, and then figure out, okay, what was the sentence that came before? What was the sentence that comes after? And so what can sentence 15 be to link those two ideas or link those two themes? So contextual reading is the aim of the game here. Um, starting off with question 15, the group led by Professor Jennifer Jacket of New York University argues that octopuses are developed and curious creatures. We can see no reason why in the 21st century, an animal such as this should become a source of mass produced food. So that implies firstly that she says that uh, octopuses are developed, they're curious, they're very advanced life forms. And then the next sentence is that um, we should not be killing them. So the link here is that there's something to do with, um, you know, farming the octopuses or breeding them or doing something that basically would um, put a strain on their lives that would essentially kill octopuses. So if we scroll through the choices, which one matches that the best? Which one matches up with being or causing death? And the answer is probably be C. Farming them intensively would probably cause large numbers of death from stress. Okay, on to the next question. So scrolling back up to the next sentence, question 16. Uh, 300 species of octopuses, or octopus I should say, um, many behaving in surprisingly sophisticated ways. And in the test, they've been shown to use 
tools. So this is the clue for the next question. Um, and then afterwards it talks about solving problems. So the link here is something that flows on from the concept of tools, which is why the best answer for question 16 is E. In one such experiment, scientists observed octopuses building shelters from pieces of coconut shells, which relates very closely to the concept of using tools. And that's why that's the best answer. Question 17. Um, numbers of octopuses, octopus caught are reported to be in decline. And then you have the missing sentence and then wild caught males and females are allowed to mate. So that implies when you look at the context of the fact that the numbers are decreasing, they're declining. And the fact that, um, you know, essentially they're catching males and females to, to allow them to mate implies that um, essentially it's a, it's a way of us coping with the decreasing numbers by creating breeding programs. So which option here fits best with that? And going through the options, you can see that the best answer would be A, fish farmers have turned to the rearing of octopuses to try and replace these dwindling catches, because that links the concept of dwindling catches, decreasing numbers or declining numbers, with them trying to rear the octopuses or to um, capture and raise them, essentially uh, create a breeding program, as just like we spoke about before. Next question. Okay, so question 18. Scrolling up, um, this one is uh, definitely a bit trickier than the other questions because you don't have two sentences to provide you context. 18 is of course the first sentence of this paragraph, but we can always derive some sense of context from the previous paragraph as well, because with these um, scientific articles and information oriented texts, generally there is a, a flow of, I mean, a logical flow of ideas. So the previous sentence was, their fertile eggs hatch out in containers and are grown into adults to be sold to markets around the globe. And then something, this has made feeding them difficult and expensive. So in other words, we're trying to find um, something, some, some sentence, some answer choice that focuses on this concept of difficulties that talks about challenges. So scrolling down, the only option that discusses that their efforts have been, um, you know, made more difficult, you know, from some challenges is G. So that's why that's the correct answer for this one. It says their efforts have founded because octopus larvae eat only live food. So that implies that they have run into some sort of difficulty, difficulty with this whole process um, because they, the larvae only eat living things, um, live feed, which makes them more difficult and more expensive to upkeep. Question 19, aqua, okay. So going to the context for question 19, aquaculturalists have learned that the young of some octopus species are less fussy about the food they eat and have used these species as basic stock for breeding. Then we have the missing sentence. As a result, companies in Australia have said they are hatching octopus eggs in captivity. So in other words, the link here is pretty much that um, they've made some sort of advances in this whole breeding process. They've found species that are less fussy. And then it cuts across to how the companies in these countries have had success. So we're trying to find an answer option that um, again, implies this concept of um, you know, advancement. And the best answer there is of course, D. There have been advances in controlling in the environments in which the octopuses are raised. And that essentially enables them to achieve um, greater successes through these advances. And then lucky last question, 20. Um, again, going through the context for this one. Now, is, this one is very important to understand the sentence that comes before and after as well. The sentence before says, companies in the countries, uh, Australia, Japan, and Mexico have said they are hatching octopus eggs in captivity and will be ready to sell farmed octopuses. So the um, context of the sentence, if I was to summarize it, is essentially that the companies have had, sorry, the countries these particular countries have had successes, they've had improved um, facilities to sell octopuses. The sentence that comes afterwards, however, um, is basically a, a bit of a rebuttal. It's a bit of a, um, a shutdown of the previous point. It says the markets for these for the animals in these countries are areas where people are already well fed. They already have access to a variety of nutritious foods. So question, the sentence for number 20 should be something that um, strikes this this, this link of the countries have had successes, but these are ironically the countries that don't need it. So it's something that puts down the value of octopus farming. Now, the other thing to be mindful of is the fact that of course, as we have eliminated all of our different answer options and scrolling back up to the top, you'll see that it says there are six sentences that have been removed and you have seven answer choices to choose from, which means there's one extra sentence that you do not need. Now, because we've gone through the process systematically and crossed out the things that we have used, the only options left for us to choose from are B and F. And B is referring to the way to protect the species over the long term. That's not the main focus. That's not the missing link. The best answer is F. The case for octopus farming is weak. That perfectly matches the idea that it's ironic that the countries that have had successes don't actually need to farm octopus. They don't, they're not reliant on this food source because the people there are already well fed, which is why the best answer is F. 
Moving on to the next passage. So read the four extracts below on the theme of dreams. So um, this again, it uh, can definitely throw off some students in that it looks very different to perhaps what they're used to. And um, we haven't seen questions that are structured in this way before, but the concepts are honestly something that we have covered in a lot of detail in the past. Um, and you know, of course we'll release another video where we go into the, the concepts themselves. I'll try and explain as much as I can here, but essentially you have four different opinions or four different um, extracts, four different experiences of people. And the questions are to do with which extract addresses what aspect. So the best way of approaching this, um, you know, this whole set of questions in the first place is to be able to succinctly summarize what each of the paragraphs say. So I'll just do that very briefly. Extract number A. So extract A, this essentially addresses the fact that, okay, let's uh, go through the key elements here. So Last night I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. So this person is visiting this place that they have already been to in the past, but they're visiting it in the dream world, right? So essentially they're dreaming and they're revisiting this place that they have been to um, in real life or in, the, in, in their waking life, I should say. And essentially what's happened is that they approach this place. Um, there's a gate there. They're not able to get through the gate. And then afterwards, suddenly they have this supernatural power that allows them to pass like a spirit, like a ghost, just go straight through the gate. And they're very confused about what happened. Um, at first I was puzzled about this, this uh, and then, sorry. And then they just proceed to discuss, you know, their experiences in the dream, right? This is pretty much the gist of it. The theme of it is that uh, they had a dream about some place that they have already visited, except now they have these supernatural powers and they can go through it. And then they just describe their experiences there. Extract B. Um, Extract B seems to have a bit more fact-based focused. Of course, it's still a persona and it is based on their opinions, but it does tend to be a bit more objective than the previous extract. Um, starts with a rhetorical question. Why do we feel the urge to talk about our dreams? And then they go on to explain that question. So um, the dreams are going to seem pretty boring to most people, but um, if you're gonna talk about it, pick the dreams in which you deal with a problem in some new way. Essentially, this person talks about dreams as something of a, t of a, um, of a lesson, something that you can learn something from, and by extension, something that other people can learn something from as well. And then of course, they do talk about this concept of most dreams being fairly ordinary situations, but it's the fact that they have such a strong emotional pull that makes them seem kind of extraordinary. Next extract, extract C. Um, this one essentially details, details the professional inspiration that this um, persona, this character can uh, take away from dreams. So at first they talk about dreams to someone, to their mother, I believe. And then they basically get told that you should not discuss or share your dreams because it's, it's, it's very boring for other people. Um, and then the persona comes to the realization that in fact, they do share their dreams, but they don't share it verbally. They don't talk and describe about what they dreamt about. Instead, they use it as the inspiration for their artwork, right? For their writing, um, drawing, any sort of creative artwork. That's the gist of extract C. Extract D, for the first time in a long time, I had a dream which I feel like writing down. So this person is um, writing down a dream that they, that they had one time. Um, specifically, it was a lucid dream. A lucid dream is essentially where you become aware of the fact that you are dreaming, and then suddenly the dynamic of it changes and you find that you can control what's happening um, and you realize that you're dreaming, essentially. So the thing that alerted them to the fact that they were dreaming is that they got a book, right? And someone told them to remember the name of the book, remember the title and the front cover of the book. But this person would try and look at it and try very hard and found that when they look back, it completely changed. And furthermore, they were not able to remember what they were supposed to remember, what they had just read. Um, and then it says there's a great Batman episode about all of this. Now, um, going off on a big tangent here, I've actually seen that Batman episode. It's very interesting. Essentially what happens is, um, indeed, Batman is dreaming. It's very similar to this persona. And as they are going through this dream, they're not, they, they think it's, he thinks it's reality until he sees a book. And on the front cover of this book is just gibberish. They're not able to read what is um, going on. And that's what alerts them to the fact that they're dreaming because something to do with different halves of your brain dealing with different things. So, you know, when you're dreaming, you're not able to focus on things like words and, and numbers and stuff like that. Just complete tangent there, but thought uh, I'd share a interesting uh, story there. So going through the questions, 21, which extract describes a feeling of awareness of being in a dream? And the best answer for this one, is of course the Batman extract, the thing that we were just talking about. It um, shows that the persona knew that they were dreaming because they weren't able to read, just like Batman. Question 22, which extract refers to using dreams as a source of professional inspiration? Remember when we summarized this, the best answer was of course uh, extract C because this person uses it as the inspiration for their art, for their um, creative work. 
which question 23, which extract mentions being able to do something in a dream that would be impossible in real life. Remember we said that in extract A, this was when the person was able to pass through the gate. They had some sort of supernatural power and they passed like a spirit through the barrier before them. Of course, that's something that they would never be able to do in their waking life or in real life. Um, best answer was A. Next question, 24, which extract argues that dreams can teach us something useful? Now, the best answer for, to this one was extract B. Remember, we spoke about how, um, you know, when you share your dreams with other people, or even when you reflect on it personally, there are many things that you can take away from it. For example, how to act in dangerous situations, how, how to deal with a threat, right? And of course, by extension, other people can learn those things as well. And that's why the best answer for this question was indeed B. Next question, uh, which extract says that people mostly dream about everyday things. Okay, this one is actually a uh, fairly simple question in that the answer was given away in just one line. It says over here, we tend to think of dreams as being really weird, but in truth, about 80% of dreams depict ordinary situations. And that's why the best answer for question 25 is also B. Question 26, which extract states that dreams usually lose their power once the person wakes up? So scrolling down to the text itself, it says here, the emotional pull of dreams. Oh, sorry. Give me one second. Um, I was looking at the wrong thing. The wrong question. So extract C. It says here that um, dreams die in the glare of the waking world. Their shimmering aura evaporating in the harsh air outside the psyche. So this implies that um, you know dreams seem very interesting at first but as soon as you wake up they disappear their powers are gone and then afterwards it becomes boring for someone to discuss it or to talk about it because that emotional pull is no longer there um, so because they have lost that power the best answer for this question was extract c going through the next question which extract mentions a place that looked different in a dream from its appearance in the writer's memory so remember we said that extract a was the one where the persona um, went to this place called Mandalay again. And this time it was very different. And this time they found that they could not pass through the gate. And of course um, they were puzzled. They were puzzled by what they saw. And they were puzzled by the strangeness of this, uh, of this scene, of this scenario. So the best answer for this question was indeed A. Next question, uh, question 28, which extract describes how a strange occurrence prevented the writer from doing something. Okay, this again, the best answer for this one was D. It was the Batman extract. The writer um, essentially found that they were not able to read and that's a, it's a strange occurrence. They weren't able to, they were prevented from um, being able to read and memorize the, the front cover of the book. So the best, best answer for this question is of course, extract D. Question 29, which extract explains the reason we are willing to accept absurd things in our dreams as significant? Okay, the answer for this one is actually in a, um, just in, in a single line, a detail that gives it away. So scrolling down to something that um, talks about accepting absurd things in our dreams as significant. Okay, it says here, the emotional pull of dreams makes even the strangest incongruities seem meaningful and worthy of discussion and interpretation. So what that sentence implies is that even things that are very absurd, right, or something that happens very in a very um, strange way, something that uh, you have no idea what's going on, a strange incongruity seems meaningful and worthy of discussion. And the reason we're able to accept it, of course, is because of the emotional pull element. So this sentence is, of course, the giveaway for um, question 29. And then Lucky last, question 30, which one discusses some advice about relaying dreams to others? And of, that of course is the extract where the um, persona talks about how they spoke to someone, I believe it was their mother. And the mother of course says that um, they should not talk about their dreams because it's going to sound boring to anyone else that listens. Um, the giveaway for this one is right here. Um, it's boring to listen. So, you know, there's some advice here. So that's why the best answer for this one was extract C.